1999, legendary rock band KISS joined forces with World Championship Wrestling after Gene Simmons presented the company with an idea to debut a new KISS-themed wrestler. The idea was also pitched to the WWF, but Simmons went where the money was, and that was WCW. The wrestler was the Kiss Demon and was originally portrayed by Brian Adams, only to be quickly replaced by Dale Torberg, a former baseball player turned wrestler. The new wrestler was quite unpopular with the fans almost instantly, but perhaps even worse was the way he debuted. Kiss was set to perform on an episode of Nitro, but instead of opening the show or playing somewhere in between hours, they decided to end the WCW weekly hit show with a one-song performance by the band that reportedly cost the company half a million dollars. What happened next? Well, younger wrestling fans like myself at the time that could care less about Kiss quickly changed the channel to Raw, in turn missing the debut of the Kiss Demon and resulting in an all-time low rating for a segment on Nitro. Needless to say, Kiss were the only winners that night. Scott Hall's drinking problems were starting to get out of hand by 1998. So what does WCW decide to do? Make it into a storyline, of course. During his feud with longtime friend and former tag team partner Kevin Nash, Hall was often shown in segments completely wasted. One promo aired from a bar where Hall could barely hold his head up, let alone speak clearly. In another segment, he actually vomited on Eric Bischoff. To top things off, he would make his entrance to the ring with a drink in hand, stumbling down the entrance ramp and wrestling while wobbling around the ring. Now this was all done in kayfabe, of course. Hall admitted that he never got drunk before matches due to the risk of injuring somebody, but clearly this was in extremely poor taste and even Bischoff himself would eventually agree, putting an end to the storyline before too long. Many fans still aren't quite sure what happened at Bash at the Beach 2000, despite hearing the story from many sides. Jeff Jarrett was set to defend his title against Hulk Hogan, but in a desperate attempt to boost ratings, Vince Russo decided on a worked shoot angle, telling Jarrett to lay down as soon as the match started, with Hogan pinning him and becoming the new champion. This was followed by Hogan's speech bashing Russo and WCW and then walking out. Everything went as planned, except the part where Russo went on to bash Hogan, something that they hadn't discussed. Hogan followed by suing WCW for defamation of character and was never seen on WCW programming again. So was it a work? Yeah, sure, that's how it started, but it quickly became something more. WCW was known for some bizarre gimmicks and debuts throughout the decades, but few as bizarre as the Yeti. Ronald Reese, who later wrestled as simply Reese in Raven's Flock, was set to debut a new character at Halloween Havoc 1995. During the match between Hogan and the Giant, the Dungeon of Doom would send their insurance policy, the Yeti, to the ring. Reese made his way through the curtain, appearing to be draped in used toilet paper wrapped from head to toe. Tony Schiavone was absurdly excited as the Yeti and Giant sandwiched Hulk Hogan in between the two monsters in what they described as a bear hug. Capital Combat was a pay-per-view event that took place in Washington, D.C. in May of 1990. What is this event most known for? Robocop. Yes, you heard me right. Sting got into a little bit of trouble with the horseman, leading to him being locked in a cage. None other than Robocop himself comes to Sting's rescue, ripping the door right off of the cage. It seemed like a good idea on paper, I guess, but this segment was panned hardly by critics and regarded as one of WCW's worst moments. It's a shame too because there was actually some good wrestling on this card, but it'll always be overshadowed by Robocop. I feel like the whole Judy Bagwell thing in WCW just went too far. Case in point, during Buff Bagwell's heel run, Rick Steiner brought in Bagwell's mom who was used for a series of storylines already, but the most bizarre would probably have to be when she became one half of the WCW Tag Team Champions with Rick Steiner. 
Now, technically, she didn't actually compete for the titles as she was merely selected by Rick Steiner as his new partner and thus champion, but still, why? The Finger Poke of Doom. Some love it, most hated it. In mid-1998, the NWO was split into two factions, the babyface Wolfpack group led by Nash and the heel black and white group led by Hogan. The two may have donned the same letters, but they had grown to become quite different. At Starcade, Goldberg lost his first match in WCW to Nash, also losing the World Heavyweight Championship in the process. On the January 4th episode of Nitro, Hogan was set to face Nash for the title, the ultimate clash of the NWO leaders. As the match went underway, the two men taunted and trash-talked each other until Hogan extended his index finger and poked it into Nash's chest, causing Nash to fling back like he was just shot. Hogan dropped down and pinned Nash for the 1-2-3 and the title, reuniting the NWO once again. Now, we were supposed to feel had and duked, but most didn't feel much at all. It had grown a bit stale already, and we were kind of over it. This was also the same night that Tony Schiavone announced that Mankind was to win the WWF Championship, causing viewership for Nitro to drop as millions of people changed the channel to Raw. The whole night was quite a bizarre one for WCW. Halloween Havoc 1998 is famous for many reasons. This was the night that the bizarre feud between Hogan and Ultimate Warrior would come to a head, becoming one of the worst matches in WCW history. Even Bischoff himself admitted such. But for me, the biggest drawback of the night is the one match we didn't get to see. The pay-per-view ran past the three-hour mark, with feeds for the show going black as the main event between Goldberg and DDP was starting a bout that was hailed as one of the best Halloween Havoc matches ever. WCW ended up refunding a lot of customers' money as well as airing the match for free the next night on Nitro, but many agree that if the match would have aired as planned, the pay-per-view maybe wouldn't have been remembered for the horrible Hogan Warrior 2 match. The weeks leading up to Halloween Havoc saw the feud between the Steiner brothers growing, but another bizarre storyline was taking place. Rick Steiner was being stalked by some mysterious person who, on an episode of Nitro, revealed himself to be none other than Chucky. The Bride of Chucky was being released that month and Universal wanted to tap into a huge audience for marketing. This is pretty common these days and WWE ties in stuff like this all the time. I mean. What the hell was with that KFC Dolph Ziggler ad? Anyway, Rick Steiner stood there in the ring actually having a conversation with Chucky, telling him to come down to the ring on numerous occasions, insinuating that he wanted to fight the doll. This was right about the time WCW was getting a little too big for their britches. Most people would agree that one of the lowest points of WCW was when actor David Arquette became WCW World Heavyweight Champion. Arquette starred in the movie Ready to Rumble, which featured a lot of WCW wrestlers in it. During promotion for the movie, Arquette became heavily involved in WCW television, at which point Vince Russo decided it would be good for business if he became champion, something Arquette was against as a fan of wrestling. Now, to be fair, he pinned Bischoff to win the title, so it's not like an established wrestler had to lie down for him, but to this day, it's still hard to see the logic behind this move that's been regarded as one of the worst moments in wrestling. At the Great American Bash in 1999, the stage was set for a showdown between Sting and Rick Steiner, who had recently reunited with his brother Scott. The match gets underway and things are seemingly normal for a while. That is until the match spills backstage where Tank Abbott proceeds to attack Sting, but what comes next is the bizarre part. Scott Steiner is seen with a massive Rottweiler, the camera angle changes and all of a sudden Sting is being attacked by dogs. Oh, and I failed to mention that Sting lost the majority of his face paint earlier in the match, but all of a sudden it looks like it did when the match started. Oh, and I also failed to mention that only some of these clips are actually Steve Borden, while the rest clearly contain a stunt double. 
after a series of pretty bad edits and some continuity errors, the security team finally gets things under control, but it was too late. The segment bombed and the fans expressed just how much disappointment they felt. Never use animals in professional wrestling, it usually always turns out horribly. In 1999, WCW decided that they needed to change things up a bit. As the company started to feature edgier segments and focus their content towards an older demographic, they felt the company's image needed to follow suit. They decided to place an ad featuring the date of April 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern, with a quote that reads, Looks like something a bird left on the hood of my car, with a blurred out version of the new WCW logo in the background. Now this is bizarre for many reasons. First off, it explains nothing really, I mean, it's not giving me a reason to tune in. Had they explained that WCW was being reborn and Nitro was receiving an overhaul, I would have been absolutely juiced to see it, and I'm sure many others would have as well. Secondly, the logo hadn't even debuted yet and they're already bashing it? They're comparing it to bird crap. I'm sure it's meant to be funny, but how can we take this rebrand seriously if the company promoting it doesn't? Unfortunately, this era was the beginning of the WCW downfall. There are obviously a lot more bizarre WCW moments, and I'm sure you guys know of some, so go ahead and share them in the comments section. And until next time, as always, thanks for watching.